Bibles, follow us to turn on the ravine on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made to benefit humankind and not humankind to benefit the Sabbath, according to Jesus. So it's for our own good. <clears throat> it serves us. We're not the ones that serve this thing that must be um, maintained. We're not slaves to it. We're actually designed to need the Sabbath. It's how we're wired. It is to be kept holy, and holy not in the sense of blameless, but holy in the sense of set apart and special. I think holiness is a word that doesn't come easy to us in the 21st century. Um, we have a lot of good reminders in this particular church about holiness and what it really means, but traditionally, in my experience of, you know, in my mid-50s, and in a whole bunch of different church circles that were part of my growing up and their parents and their ministry as uh, pastors and, and missionaries, the word holiness doesn't always have a positive connotation or can feel out of reach, not a table, but it largely means to have something be holy, to be set apart and special. So the Sabbath is, the Sabbath is a time to remember and love God and to remember and love our neighbor. And it comes from, the first time the word is used is in the, or almost the first time, is in the Ten Commandments in Exodus. And it's kind of in the middle there. And we have um, a couple do, it doesn't necessarily use the word do, but they're positive things that we should do these things. And then we have seven, eight things that say don't. Um, and you know, to me as a you know, practitioner, follower of Christ in the 21st century and under the new covenant and not the old covenant, um, I do wonder sometimes about the Ten Commandments, that they're so negative sounding. There are positive ways that you could say some of these things. And this is what it is. I'm not saying that um, Moses transcribed things incorrectly, but there is a different feel of the Old Covenant that felt more about laws and things you need to do and not do and versus the New Covenant and all the things that Jesus talked about, which were largely positive things, were invitations to things. So we have these two do's, and then we have these two groups of things on each side of this command about the Sabbath. The first three have to do with our allegiance to God and remembering God's place in our lives and in our world and not misusing God's name and um, remembering God as the one who brought us when we were Jews in Egypt or whether we're Christians today out of slavery. And then below this commandment about the Sabbath is all, are all these um, six commands about how we treat our neighbors, how we respond to our neighbors. But what if the Sabbath is actually still a command that we're commanded to obey? And what if it's a matter of obedience? So I'm going to just talk through a whole bunch of different ways of thinking about the Sabbath. None of them is the right or the wrong or the most important, but different ways of just having a perspective on the Sabbath. Sabbath as investment. It's an investment of downtime. We're preserving some margin. I like to use this word margin a lot. It just kind of is in my speech about if I feel like I have something that I need to do and I don't feel like I can actually can tackle it or give it creative energy, you know, the words that I usually use are like, I just don't feel like I have the margin to do that. Um, if you don't have any margin in the size of your sheet of paper, you can't write any more notes. Um, but it's an investment of obedience. It's an investment of our attention to God. A long-term investment strategy, if you want to think of it, <clears throat> comparing it to financial investment. It's also a divestment in some ways from production and consumption. And if I were a theologian, but which I'm not, one of the books that I read is by a theologian named Walter Brueggemann, who has written a book on the Sabbath. Um, and he can talk much more extensively about, in the Old Testament context, with 
the emphasis on production and when, when the um, Israelites were in Egypt and were slaves, they were forced to do, produce more and were given less resources to still produce the same amount. And all the emphasis was on, and they needed to work seven days a week. They didn't have a Sabbath. They couldn't take a break. Um, so there's a way that we don't necessarily relate to that, but we also, in our own society, have ways that we have an over-focus on production and, um, and also consumption. So Jesus still says, God still says, I want you to remember that I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery. <coughs> Maybe that's slavery to consumerism or to restlessness. Sabbath has submission, obedience, and also following God's example, who rested on the seventh day. Whether or not you think of those as 24-hour days or some different way of articulating these ways that God created creation, but at some point said, I'm going to rest and take this in and observe. And if we're made in God's image, then that's actually probably how we are wired to need that cyclical rest. Sabbath has dependence on God economically, and trusting God that Sabbath living might actually be a good use of our time, not for this thing that we grudgingly do and feel like it's not, I'm not, I got things that I should be doing, and I'm going to try to observe the Sabbath instead of viewing it as this positive thing that's really good for us, um, and giving God the first fruits of our time as we depend on God. Sabbath as maybe a solution to weariness. Come to me, all you are, are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. <laughs> Recharging our batteries. This is so funny, my dad. Um, thinks that this is his original joke. <laughs> for that. And he thinks that he has not told us this joke before. <laughs> and he's actually really good at napping, and I've inherited that. And some people are jealous of that when they want to be, but it's not something that they're able to do. Um, I can power nap for five or ten minutes. and So Dad can do all of that, and he loves to tell this joke. But he's also a wise follower of Jesus. And he, you know, as a pastor and as a missionary, um, as someone that's in ministry, I think you can attest to it's a little bit hard to, to observe the Sabbath on Sunday. Um, so it's a discipline to find another day when you can do that. The spirit versus the letter of the law. What's the spirit behind the Sabbath? It's not about um, did we not walk too many steps or travel too far or, or get, you know, heal someone on the Sabbath or rescue a sheep from a ravine. But what's the spirit of the Sabbath and are we following the spirit of the Sabbath? Let's not make the same mistakes that Jesus pointed out that the disciples are making. I love this, this phrase by Enlamat. Almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes. Including you. And this is actually a whole chapter. This is the chapter of one of the chapters of the Jesus book. <laughs> a way of resetting. Sabbath as repose. Um, not all parts of the world have seasons like we do in Wisconsin. We have a fresh reminder of the season we're in as of a couple nights ago. Um, and the way that the green goes away and the, the trees, I mean, if you look around, the trees appear to be dead. And if, you, if you're in the summer, there are some trees that do look that way still, and they are dead. <laughs> <laughs> all the trees, all the life looks dead. And what's happening is it's dormant, but it's actually there's renewal that's happening. Um, it's a fascinating thing. Work and rest, production, but also replenishing. Sabbath can be used as just a reminder, like the commandment itself says, the wording, about who God is, who I am, whose I am, and the fact that in life and in death, we belong to God. Sabbath might be 
a way of thinking about an alternative to anxiety. Um, I think that anxiety is a huge, huge issue in just in the last 10, 15 years in our society across many, many different age ranges, but in a way that wasn't the case a longer time ago. Maybe some of you who um, whose profession is in the area of, of counseling and, and therapy and working with people can speak to that more clearly. But um, And I'm not saying that anxiety will go away because we observe the Sabbath, but what's involved in um, divesting and turning off and resting and reminding ourselves of who we are and whose we are, um, I think would be a significant solution to the issue of anxiety, whether it's practiced only within the church or by people outside of the church who are, feel crushed by the obligations and out of control nature and also just dynamics like the use of technology. So I'm not an expert to talk on that, but I have this hunch that that's actually that the concepts behind observing the Sabbath are concepts that are that contain solutions to this problem in our society. What is the downside of observing the Sabbath? What do we have to lose if we observe the Sabbath? Here's a question, that, and you can call out if you have any thoughts about this. What's the difference between observing the Sabbath and fasting? What are similarities or differences? Anybody? Well, I was going to say about the first slide, uh, the challenge is to go against the culture. I'm sorry, can you speak up? The challenge is to go against the culture. I'm sure most of us in this room remember, because we're of a certain age, when stores were closed on Sundays. You couldn't go shopping. Activities were not planned on Sundays. And, and that's all different now. So to really, I mean, risk, risk, it's not a risk, but it's a challenge to, to go against, I mean, even for me, to go against, oh, I can shop for that thing. Yeah. Or maybe I don't need to right now. Yep. So does anyone, anyone have any thoughts about this question of, about differences or similarities between the Sabbath and fasting? Well, one of the differences, uh, you're, you're trying to focus on um, physical things with fasting. You're, you're fasting from generally food. Mm -hmm. But I think we're... Um, fasting and the observing the Sabbath come together is is that you're literally trying to focus on God. You're not trying to trying to, you know, cut something from your life. You're trying to recenter yourself. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? I think it's what you said earlier, Mary. I think observing the, the fasting is um, sort of denying yourself physically, denying food. The Sabbath is sort of denying, so that's kind of potentially the consumerism side. The Sabbath is more about not observing, taking a break from the productivity side. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think they're both a detoxification. When you do that, you allow other your attention and your the resources of your spirit and body and mind to go in directions that they wouldn't. Yeah. And I think the challenge is equal between those two. I mean, fasting is, mm -hmm. is difficult on the body and the mental concentration. For me and probably for lots of other people who work all week, it's a challenge to say, I'm not going to sit at my computer and do my work on Sunday, but I'm going to really give myself a chance to reset. It's yeah. really hard for me. In fact, I'm planning to go home this afternoon and sit at my computer and do work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. That. <laughs> Sabbath is, can be a choice of rhythm rather than letting my circumstances dictate my spiritual rhythm. <clears throat> And not just spiritual, but also just health, um, health and managing stress and um, spending time on good things that are replenishing and not just on the things that I feel like I have to do and I'm behind. Um, and setting some kind of a regular daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually rhythm by choice. 
here are just a few, a list of a few ways. Some of these were on the list that you guys put up on screen. Reading, maybe not reading the news. That might not be the most stressful thing to us. <laughs> Exercising, spending time with a friend or a family member. Sleeping. Have you heard that joke about the... <laughs> <laughs> um, meditating, mindfulness practices, listening to music or playing music, making some art, going and seeing some art, <clears throat> praying, doing centering prayer, doing journaling, spending time in God's creation, doing something kind for someone, doing something life-giving, preparing and eating nourishing food, those are some ideas. Um, there are obstacles to the Sabbath. Many of them are obvious. Economic pressure. I think for people in poverty, especially who are working multiple jobs or who are unemployed, it could be really hard to sort of like, what are they resetting? Like they're already feeling like there's nothing mm -hmm. left. They have nothing left to give, and they're at the the end of their rope. Um, and I think that's an obstacle. They, in some ways need the Sabbath just as much as people on the other end of the extreme. Um, responsibilities can be obstacles that are real. Um, <coughs> as a caregiver or as someone who has kids, you can't just like, um, you know, I can't really help you with that because I'm observing the Sabbath today, honey. <laughs> um, regular demands on our time, um, our own habits of how we use time, Habits from our culture sometimes, or things that we've, you know, sports and TV are a couple that I'm not trying to make a bad list of like, avoid these things. Um, but they can be things that consume time that could be spent in a way that resets us. Technology can be an obstacle. Expectations that others have or we have of ourselves. Stress and anxiety and the, that sense of needing to be productive with our time. Um, just being busy and anything you know don't make false images it's not about you could read that the letter of that and say you know you shouldn't be photographer because you're making images and i don't think that's what that meant um, but making false images and and ascribing sort of worth to things that actually are replacing god's place in our own consciousness and in our world and how we spend our resources can, can we go back to that for a second, Because yeah. I think the big challenge here, I mean, even for me, I, I look at the expectations, and even with your previous slide, it's like, oh, I have to do the Sabbath right. You know, if, if I'm not doing one of those, and I know that's not what you were saying, but yeah. because you, the, the one before this one, like, oh, okay, if I do any one of these things, then it's okay. <coughs> and, but if I, you know, this is the challenge. I mean, I think this is part of the whole challenge yeah. with, with this topic. <coughs> it's great to talk about that. And we live in a society that just has, I think it's true in general of Western and modern and developed society, that it's just like overly full. Mm -hmm. And it just, it's very stressful. Um, people who live in much more simple cultures where they may be in the developing world, but they might not be living in extreme poverty. Um, I think it's easier in some ways in the routines and the priorities and rhythms of their lives for them to have space where they feel like they can observe Sabbath, and um, so I think it's it's unique in some ways to our to our day in the, in the last you know, few decades. Yes, there is. It strikes me too that an obstacle is sometimes trust. Will God be sufficient for the rest yep. of my life if I set that time aside? It's sort of like tithing to yeah. me. You know, all of my money is God's, but do I trust? And is it a reminder to me as I give of my money that all is God's resources? And Sabbath, if I give of my time, is it reminding me that all of my time is God's, but that I am entrusting a portion of this not only to God, but as a reminder to myself? And so that sort of speaks to me of, do I trust? Do I yeah. believe in God's sufficiency for me if I set aside this time? Yeah, exactly. And it's really, I have a really easy answer, just trust and obey. <laughs> There's no other way. Yes. I just want to say that I view the Sabbath maybe a little bit more conceptually, too. Mm -hmm. We have a summer place at Greenland Conference Center, the American Baptist Assembly, and 
they're getting ready for their 75th anniversary, which Dale, I can assure you, wine will not be served. <laughs> uh, and so it's a lot of the words that are used to describe the Sabbath on any day of the week when you're there. You're in nature, you center, you spend time with God, we don't have TV, internet doesn't work. I mean, you just really kind of divorce yourself from all that. And so when I've done a lot of thinking about what it means to be there, and it's very Sabbath-like, if that's a mm -hmm. phrase that I can use. Mm -hmm. so other, did you um, picking up on several things, it involves letting go, which for someone with control issues like myself <laughs> can be challenging because to trust, you have to let go. Mm -hmm. And I might have to let go of my perceived to-do list for an afternoon or a, a space of time. And I think making that jump to trusting God and letting go of me arranging everything. Um, oh, first of all, if you can do it, it reduces anxiety dramatically. <laughs> but it also allows Sabbath to become more a part of the fabric of life with less stress yeah have you ever been in a situation where you start to get sick or you someone else you know yourself or someone else you hear this phrase I just can't afford to get sick right now mm -hmm. we have this sense of being indispensable which We're is not. mostly true for most of us <laughs> but um, that phrase of you know like I just can't afford to be sick and then the person gets really really sick and is completely out for three days or five days or two weeks and then when they're well again we don't usually stop to take this in, but like the world still turns, <laughs> uh, things still happen. We were absent for a while, but sometimes I think our body actually needs to get sick because it's the only way that we'll stop. And it happens, and then we actually are replenished, even though we thought of it as just this negative thing experience in our lives. <coughs> I'm not going to talk through each of these, but um, the concept of Sabbath can be replacing something that's not necessarily bad, but was something that, something different. Not necessarily the polar opposite either. Um, production is good. We're commanded to be creative and um, to fill the earth, and that's a good thing, but sometimes we need to rest, and that's actually what the guy in, in the context of the Israelites, why Jesus said, take this day and don't work and don't, don't produce. Um, replacing noise with quiet. Replacing absence with presence, if that's what we need, with God's presence. Or maybe the opposite way around. Replace mm -hmm. the presence of all the stuff that's distracting and a burden with some absence, with some space, with some margin. <coughs> Re replacing hurry with time. Maybe replacing our tendency to be on autopilot and like this, I gotta do this stuff and this is what I do on it's the weekend and before the week starts, I gotta do this Sunday and I got just a few hours left to accomplish and then replace that with intentionality about how we use that time. Yes? I was thinking, um, I live in the Upper Peninsula and I volunteer at the camp up there quite a bit. What they do with the children at the camp is play I Spy. Where did you spy God today? Mm -hmm. And I kind of put that into my life because I have to drive quite a bit to get mm -hmm. anywhere where mm -hmm. I live <laughs> to do shopping. Or when any time you are somewhere, where do the intentionality, where is God, where do you see God right now? Or if you're amongst a lot of people, how is that? How can I see that person as being Jesus? And how, can, how would I treat that person? So just very intentional, everyday, normal stuff is <coughs> a Sabbath rest, I think. You know, yeah. because I can say, oh, well, thank you, God, that bird was so beautiful, mm -hmm. or something like that. You know? Yep. Yeah. Exactly. It's not just a weekly a, calendar it's not a issue. Of time. It's going to be a daily, yeah. moment by moment yeah. practice. Moments, yeah. Yeah. Um, a couple, I'll mention a couple of these things. Well, how long should a Sabbath be? Does it have to be all day? Um, it would be good if it's all day. I don't think that Jesus 
redefined that and said, well, you know, if you can get a squeeze in a couple of hours, that's fine. <laughs> um, but I don't think it's about the law. I don't think it's about an obligation. I think it's, it is a, to a degree about obedience, but the amount of time, or if we're able to do this kind of thing and benefit from this, and it happens to be a half a day, I think that's still a good thing. Um, that Sabbath is a good way to worship God with our time and a good space to listen to God. That if we don't make that space, then we're actually not going to have that opportunity to listen to God in the same way. It's a good day to show and tell people good news, um, which should be happening daily as we have an opportunity to talk about what's good news to us. And um, Next week, actually, Angie is going to be leading us in, in that topic. Um, good day to enjoy creation and to remember what Sabbath actually means. So I don't think we're going to take this discussion time because we have actually been doing this along the way, which is what I wanted, which is even better. Um, does anyone have any last, like, one or two people, things you'd like to, we have about five more minutes? Okay. Are there, are there any thoughts you want to, questions that you have that you want to pose to the group or observations and comments? When you talk about how long is the Sabbath, um, maybe some of us need to think about the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has anyone here taken a sabbatical? Usually we think of it in a work context. Has anyone taken a sabbatical? None of us have. <laughs> One. One. You want to say anything about that? It wasn't experience? from work necessarily. It was a time away by myself mm -hmm. and in one of my favorite places. Um, and just the opportunity to come away to just enjoy God's creation and to listen. It was one of the most profound weeks mm -hmm. I've ever spent. Mm -hmm. And I long for that again. Yeah. Um, yeah, just such a special time. It's a way of getting perspective that, by definition, when we stay in the same circumstances and routines and obligations, we can't get perspective. We can still live healthy lives and try to make good decisions and use our resources well. But by stepping away from that either geographically or with really changing our weekly routines for a period of time, we're able to get perspective that can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Ellen? This is an unsabbatical, but exactly. But I think, you know, when, for those of us who have spent any time in Africa, I think one thing, at least that I came away with, is we are so wildly independent and so determined to be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. And I think um, one of the things I mean at this stage in life is that um, we're really not meant to live that way. And I think, you know, one way to get more time to live intentionally, to be in nature and all those things, is to to help each other, to work with other people. I mean, I think of all the young mothers who are just on 24-7 and, you know, with no break in sight. And, you know, if you can bring other people into your life, um, you know, that makes a difference. So I guess I think community is sort of something yeah. that works into this as well. So there might be, not just might be, but there are ways that we actually can with accountability to each other about what our intention is about Sabbath observing, but also what do we need in order to be able to do that with some of the responsibilities and stages of life we are we are in, and um, things that we that we need to accomplish. The community can be part of the solution of giving us that space to be able to do it. One more thought, <laughs> Peter. Uh, what brought, what came to mind was the scripture of Isaiah 30, where God says, "In quietness and in confidence will be your strength." 
but you refused that. You said, I will flee on quick horses. Mm -hmm. Well then, the horses that follow you will be even faster. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's not like the things which uh, are chasing us are gonna slow down. We, we just have to say, uh, I'm not gonna ride anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> Let me skip through a couple slides here. Oh, I just want to mention uh, three books that I meant to bring with me out of each of these books, but um, and I think we'll get these added one or two copies to the book cart. Um, Sabbath as Resistance by Walter Brueggemann, Subversive Sabbath by A.J. Swoboda. And Keeping the Sabbath Holy by Margaret Dawn. Um, I have not read all the way through any of these, but I've read parts of them. And Margaret Dawn, I actually think I read way back when, like 30 years ago or so, and, and I want to reread it, uh, just glancing through it. So those are three books that I, that I would recommend. Um, I think that's all the time we have, but Andrea, mm -hmm. can tell us a little bit about yes. what's coming up. Thank you, Barry. So you can see the list up here. As I said earlier, there's also some of these forms that will be in the pews in the sanctuary, and you can also take them with you that list out the topics that we'll be covering over the next few months here. And we really encourage you to uh, dig in here, to think about next steps each, each Sunday that you attend a faith cafe. How do you want to apply this? What does this mean for you? What are you thinking about differently, having heard what Barry shared this morning? What do you want to know more about? And so we invite you to come. I also challenge you to be invitational to the other folks in our congregation to bring them with you here as well so that you're learning, you're bringing other people to learn, uh, to share this really important work of, of going deeper and connecting and growing together. Uh, next week is faith sharing, as Barry mentioned. So Angie Dickens and Laura Andrews will be talking about how faith is shared in their day-to-day -day lives. So not necessarily kind of uh, traditional evangelical uh, uh, sharing faith and uh, sharing the gospel, but sharing the gospel by who you are and bringing it up in ways that are meaningful and that might feel more integrated into a day-to-day -day conversation than showing a kind of four spiritual laws <laughs> sort of approach to it. Nothing wrong with that, but also just saying how do we integrate this into who we are, how we show, and so Angie and Laura will talk a little bit differently about how, to, how they share their faith and what that looks like for them. So we invite you to join us for that. So please join me in prayer. God, thank you so much for the Sabbath, for this gift of rest that you've given us, for new insights in it, and hopefully new action steps to take to rest. Um, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the intentionality of work and of rest, and that that's the example that you've set for us. So God, we pray that you would uh, bring us close to you through that, challenge us to put things down or to pick things up so that we might continue to grow deeper um, and be who you would have us become in this. So go with us now. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Thanks, Barry. Thank you.